Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Kim Dennis. I'm the co-founder and chief medical officer here at SunCloud Health. Delighted that you're joining us for today's Grand Rounds. Um, I will tell you a little bit about SunCloud Health. We are a multi-level of care treatment center that really specializes in providing integrated care for patients, adolescents, and adults with multi-morbidities. Typically, our patients will have some combination of mental health diagnosis, eating disorder, addiction, and or trauma. We have IOP and PHP programs in three locations in the Chicago area, as well as two residential locations in the Chicago area. Um, upcoming in the next four to six weeks, we will have an IOP PHP program in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, that we've, we're opening up around one of our psychiatrists who moved with her husband. Um, she's too good to not do one of these out there. So um, as I said, I'm delighted that you're joining us today. We have many, many people also joining via live stream. Uh, we have a room full of people for those of you on live stream who are here with us in person as well. And it's my pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Josh Siegel, who's going to be talking to us today about psychedelics. He received a BA in philosophy, neuroscience, and psychology from Wash U, and then completed an MD PhD program in systems neuroscience at Wash U's uh, School of Medicine. He joined the Wash U Department of Psychiatry faculty in July 2022. He has 13 years experience in neuroscience and has published more than 30 peer-reviewed articles in the fields of neuroimaging and neuropsychopharmacology. He was a recipient of the NIMH Outstanding Resident Award in 2020. Very, very accomplished clinician scientist, um, neuroscientist at a very young age. He completed training as a psychedelic facilitator with USONA Institute in Madison, Wisconsin. His research really focuses on using human neuroimaging to understand ketamine, psilocybin, and similar molecules that rapidly stimulate homeostatic plasticity. In addition to founding WashU's program in psychedelics research, he serves as a deputy editor at the Journal of Psychedelic Psychiatry created a graduate course named Mechanisms of Rapid Antidepressants, founded the Wash U Rapid Antidepressants Journal Club, and served on the advisory board for psychedelic startup companies. Without further ado, I welcome Dr. Josh Siegel. Thank you, Dr. Dennis, for that overly gracious introduction. And thank you for having me here. And also thanks to Diane for setting everything up. Pleasure to, pleasure to talk with you all. Oh, OK. So uh, I am going to start with my disclosures. And so I am uh, uh, employed by a pharmaceutical company at this point. Just make that clear. And but I won't be talking about any of the work with them. I'll be talking, and they're not directly related to psychedelics. Um, I'll be talking about mostly, really, my goal and priority is to give a overview of psychedelics as kind of implied by the title. Um, and I will throw in a little of the research that, that we've done at WashU. Um, and uh, that research was supported by USONA Institute, so that's also a relevant disclosure just um, uh, in terms of providing us with, with study drug and with training um, for human psychedelics research. So uh, the objectives are consider recent data supporting psychedelics as medicine, uh, review hallucinogen pharmacology, consider risks and challenges of psychedelics as medicine, and discuss possible therapeutic mechanisms, which is really my, the, the area that I'm most uh, interested in uh, personally, um, is understanding these drugs uh, from a therapeutic mechanism and neuroscientific standpoint. And so 
Uh, and then, and then I think we're gonna just last thing to say we're gonna have questions at the end. Is that right? And so uh, I will say at the outright at the forefront that you know I'm not an eating disorders expert and I'm not involved with eating disorders research with psychedelics. So <laughs> I, I'm sure that you know you all be asked will be curious about that and asking about that. But I'm just making that clear. I do put a little information in the in the presentation about it um, um, but you know that's not something that I directly would say that I am an expert in so to introduce the topic um, this is this is the human brain it's it's the most complex computer that we that we know of that we have um, at least for now maybe not for long I don't know but <laughs> but uh, the human brain, um, to quote uh, Mark Rakel, who's a neuroscience mentor of mine, um, it's in the prediction business. And what that means is that really um, it's at any given second taking in maybe a million bits, less than a million bits of information from the world around you, but brain processing is billions of bits per second. So you really have a model of the world and your brain is constantly using that model to predict what's going to happen, predict what you're going to do, predict, predict how you're going to engage with your environment. Um, and just a little bit of taking in, relatively speaking, a tiny bit of information from the environment to kind of update that model. Okay? And, and that's how I fundamentally think about the brain and, and the reason that this is relevant to uh, the practice of psychiatry and to uh, the way that I think about treatment in psychiatry uh, is this. That this is, you may have seen some form of this, this is the cognitive behavioral model, okay? And so uh, another way of saying that, that the brain is in the prediction business is, or an implication of that is that habit is fundamentally critical to what we do as humans. Um, most of what we do is based on habit and based on uh, a cycle of kind of what psychiatrists and psychologists have termed the cognitive behavioral model, which is this cycle and interaction between thoughts, feelings, and behavior. And most of which, as we know, clinically is kind of preset, not by necessarily the world around us, but rather by, you know, the internal habits um, and patterns that you have developed. And so to, to give you an example of this, um, in depression, anxiety, and PTSD, uh, but really actually, you know, I think you could take a form of this for many psychiatric diagnoses, um, you have this model which goes something like this. The world around me is a place where hardship and danger wait around every corner, and every new experience is an opportunity for pain. And these are, this is the model that people have developed. And so to, to put that into this cognitive behavioral model, it looks something like this. Um, your, your feeling or your thought, let's say, I'm sorry, we'll start with the behavior, although really you could start anywhere, is I'm going to stay home and avoid doing some activity. And uh, your thought that stems from that is, why bother to go out? I'll probably just you know, have a bad time or get hurt or, you know, be embarrassed. And the emotion that results from that is sadness. And this is a perpetuating, self-perpetuating cycle. It becomes a habit. It becomes an inescapable cycle. And, you know, our, our core training as clinicians is, is how do we break people out of this cycle? And... I think it's notable that in my training, I got very little information about what cycle I'm supposed to put them to, but we know it's not this. <laughs> um, so, uh, so hopefully this kind of introduction will, you know, you'll start to see why it's relevant to psychedelics and how I think about, you know, the sort of way that they could be treating psychiatric illness and, and how we would want to be treating psychiatric illness. So, I'll put that on hold for a second and jump to some recent clinical data with psychedelics just to give you some 
reference for where the hope comes in uh, and where things have looked promising. So this is a, um, I think, the largest published clinical trial to date with psilocybin. It was comparing three doses of psilocybin, um, 10 milligrams. Let's see, should I, can I use the pointer? I doubt it will show up. That's okay. Um, 10 milligrams, 25 milligrams, 10 milligrams, and 1 milligram, which is effectively uh, placebo. Uh, and it was for treatment-resistant depression. It was a multinational study uh, sponsored by Compass Pathways, uh, which is a pharmaceutical company that's pursuing approval from the FDA and other agencies of psilocybin for depression. And it was a single dose, single dose of psilocybin at those doses, and they, mar and they monitored depression. I believe three weeks was the primary endpoint, six weeks was the secondary endpoint after a single dose. And, uh, and what they found at their primary endpoint, and then you can see the gray line is, is the one milligram, the green is 10 milligrams, the blue is the full 25 milligram dose. And so you see a nice dose response uh, here, and it was statistically significant and a positive result and a pretty large, I would say, response given that these are individuals who had failed multiple treatments for depression prior to the study. Um, and, and here's a quote. Uh, it's not even from this study, but I think it, it captures nicely some of you know, what I've seen and what's been reported in terms of subjective report uh, of why this is a therapeutic experience. It was a change of state to be stuck in that place of rumination and to be able to move out. It reconfigures you somehow. So the main question of the back half, you might say, of my talk is, what is the mechanism? How is psilocybin, in combination with therapy, uh, accomplishing that? Uh, but before we, go, before we get to that, I will also just give a little, a few other you know, kind of, this is a very broad overview of some other areas where there's been promising results and, and interest. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Actually, before I go to that, the one other thing maybe worth noti noting from this study, uh, generally well tolerated, generally safe. There was, I think, really one uh, major adverse event related or safety event related concern, uh, which is shown in this table, which is, don't even bother trying to make sense of it. The only reason it, it was in the supplement, but uh, what I'm circling there in red is that the high dose group had three participants had serious suicidal behavior, and uh, that was not seen in the, in the placebo group. And that is something that actually has been um, reported in some psychedelic clinical trials prior to this as well. So there was some kind of prior uh, concern that makes this, even though three out of, I think it's about 80, is relatively small, um, you know, but these are obviously a serious adverse uh, event. Um, and, and so that's something. So I'll just point that out for now. And, you know, if there's questions about it later, happy to, to discuss. I, I don't think I have a definite answer. I can, you know, tell kind of my impressions of what, why that might be the case. Uh, but that is a, a concern that has been raised with psychedelics. So, um, so as I said, uh, an overview. This is another study that just came out a couple years ago of um, psilocybin for alcohol use disorder, uh, and and they had a about uh, 50 in, in each group, and they used diphenhydramine as a control, which is kind of interesting. Um, another major challenge in psychedelics has been the difficulty with adequately blinding placebo groups um, in, a, in a randomized control study. Um, They're almost always functionally unblinded. And I think even in this study, certainly the vast majority, I don't have the number up here, but correctly guessed which treatment they got, which is a serious problem, which I'll come back to a little bit later. Um, but that being said, um, there was a positive primary outcome in this study. I, again, it was, uh, this was two sessions of psilocybin or diphenhydramine, unlike the last study, which was a single session, same dose. Uh, 
oh, actually, this no, it was a, this was weight-based dosing, but equivalent to the 25 milligram on average. And the primary outcome uh, was percent of days drinking at 32 weeks after, and this was also two psilocybin doses combined with a pretty intensive um, therapy protocol. And uh, what they found was that percent of heavy days drinking at 32 weeks was lower in the psilocybin group compared to the uh, control group. It was 10% uh, heavy drinking days in the psilocybin group and 23.6% uh, in the in the diphenhydramine group. Um, so that's alcohol use disorder. And then the last thing that I've added in here, and I already gave you my disclosure that I'm not an expert in this, but there are there has been a lot of interest with anorexia and with eating disorders, and there are a number of ongoing studies. In fact, there was just a phase one study published a few weeks ago by the university, uh, by the UCSD group, um, with uh, patients with anorexia with psilocybin therapy. So this is something that is being explored um, in multiple studies. And so with that, I'll jump into a little background of just the pharmacology and uh, safety and, uh, and uh, comparison. So I guess the kind of header line here is not all hallucinogenic drugs are the same. That's probably obvious to most of you, but I think it's worth understanding that a little better. And so psilocybin is in the class of what is now being generally called classic psychedelics. Um, these are the thing that makes it a classic psychedelic is the fact that it is a serotonin uh, 5-HT2A agonist. And this is true of LSD, it's true of psilocybin, mescaline, all 5-HT2A agonists. Uh, to me, this distinction is important. Uh, ketamine has a different mechanism, although there may be some similarities. Um, and, you know, there's distinct psychedelic effects, which I list there, hallucination, hypertension, emotionality, etc. Now, for comparison, here's ketamine. Ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic. Uh, it is a NMDA antagonist. Uh, other NMDA antagonists and dissociative anesthetics include PCP, dextromethorphan, and uh, the, the hallmark effect, subjective effect, is what's called dissociation. At higher doses, it's, it's anesthesia. Um, but there are also some, so that's kind of a contrast to psychedelics. There are also some similarities, some degree of uh, hallucination and, um, you know, feeling of uh, change of sense of ego or, you know, disconnectedness with yourself or connectedness with your environment. Um, and, and of course, ketamine is increasing. What, I, what I'm showing here actually probably is not ketamine. I think it's S-ketamine, which is Spravato, which is what was approved by the FDA for the treatment of treatment-resistant depression. Um, and so that's, you know, that as well as ketamine are increasingly being used clinically. Um, and, and then MDMA, uh, or methyl deoxymethamphetamine, is uh, phenethylamine. I guess some, some people are calling the class uh, empathogen. Um, and uh, it has some overlapping effect. It's, it's kind of more of a nonspecific uh, uh, monoamine agonist. So it has some agonism of 5-HT2A, similar to psychedelics. Um, but it, I, I look at it as kind of between that and more, more of a stimulant, um, like amphetamines, uh, there's also been interest and, and there's an FDA application for MDMA for the use of PTSD. Again, something that I don't really go into in this talk, but I can talk about if, if there's questions. And then last, uh, well, certainly not, the, this is not a complete list of hallucinogens, but the last thing that I'll at least include here, I think for contrast purposes, is salvia, which is a completely different mechanism. It's a kappa opioid agonist. It is a hallucinogen, um, but it has not uh, had any real evidence of benefit for uh, analgesia or for therapeutic effect for any psychiatric indication. So, you know, just to make the point that what 
is not being said by the data is that hallucination is therapeutic, okay? So psychedelics and ketamine are therapeutic, maybe in some, or this is the data that I've showed you, right? Um, maybe in some circumstances MDMA is therapeutic, um, but this is not saying that hallucina hallucinatory drugs are therapeutic, right? Um, and, then, and then here, uh, I like this graph of safety. I think it's, it's just kind of an amazing <coughs> figure. It was created by work mostly from David Nutt, who was a uh, pharmacology researcher in the UK. And uh, what you see on the x-axis is how addictive a substance is. And this is a combination of uh, animal models of, uh, of addiction and of uh, voluntary use and human data. And what you see on the y-axis, no, I said that backwards, I'm sorry. The y-axis is dependence potential or how addictive the drug is. The x-axis is how lethal the drug is uh, measured by active dose over lethal dose. And, and it's just kind of an amazing graph if you look through it because uh, you can see you know, up there in the upper right corner, there's heroin, um, but, but a lot of it is just, it, the reason it's amazing to me is because when you look at this, you get the impression that U.S. scheduling of drugs is not based on anything particularly rational, right? Because you see alcohol is oh, way over there on the right as one of the most lethal and, uh, you know, pretty addictive, and then you see nicotine as, as you know, basically the most addictive uh, neck and neck with the, the opioids um, and, uh, and marijuana, they're pretty impossible to overdose, uh, you know, relatively low addiction. Of course, it is worth pointing out these are two important dimensions, but not the only dimensions of, you know, is a drug dangerous or harmful. Um, but the other reason I like this, I'm about to show you, is that here is psychedelics and LSD and psilocybin, and one thing they certainly have going for them is that they are, you're not going to overdose, and they are not uh, physically addictive in the way that many of these drugs are. Um, there are, so mescaline is a little more uh, lethal because it's hitting other targets besides the 5-HT2A receptor. Um, there are some risks, though. This is not to say that there are no risks with psychedelics. And one I uh, list here, which is that mania or psychosis in those with pre-existing risk um, can present itself after a, a psychedelic dose. Another we were talking about um, just before this is that in individuals with um, pre-existing arrhythmia risk, there's some uh, cardiovascular risk for either arrhythmia or uh, valvular malfunction in response to a psychedelic. So we screen out anybody with, you know, first degree relatives with either themselves or first degree relatives with a serious psychotic illness history uh, or with any, you know, uh, positive findings on the EKG. And so that's, so that's the safety question. And so now, uh, you know, what I said I think was the back half of my talk is really getting into this question, why would psilocybin treat depression? And uh, the way that I like to think about this question, it's been a very interesting debate in the, in the you know, research and clinical, really, field. Uh, and, and the more I've kind of learned about it and read about it, the more this uh, idea, this levels of neuroscience, which was first put forward by Churchland and Sajnowski, which goes back to, you mentioned I did my, part of my undergrad training was philosophy of neuroscience. So this was, this was an important idea, which is that we can think about the brain uh, at many different levels, and you might be studying the brain at the molecular level and come up with various rules and theories, and it's not always clear how, you might be studying the brain at the systems level and come up with other rules and theories, and it's not always clear how those two things fit together they do fit together, and they have to fit together. Um, and so, you know, so hopefully it will become clear in the next, you know, as I talk about some answers to why would psilocybin treat depression, why this is kind of a useful lens to, to look at that question. So I'm going to start up here because I think it's probably the most intuitive. Uh, 
with the level of psychology in the mind. And, and this is the, the oldest answer that anybody who's, who is a psychedelic, you know, underground psychedelic therapy practitioner will give you, which is that psychedelics cause a mystical or transformational experience. And in fact, um, the, the first study that really kind of opened Pandora's box um, was in some respects to try to answer that question um, or test that idea in a rigorous scientific way. And what they did in that study, uh, which is very similar to what we have done in, in some of our research, is they had gave individuals a single dose of uh, psilocybin and a high dose, 30 milligrams per kilo, 70 kilograms, which is I think probably about equivalent in most people to five grams of psilocybin mushrooms. And they had uh, two facilitators provide counseling, including preparation before the dose and what's called integration therapy after the dose, as well as oversight and um, safety monitoring during for six to eight hours during the dose. And, and they had volunteers um, kind of like you see in the picture with, for the most part, with a mask on um, headphones on uh, with music playing, encouraged to have a very internal experience, um, which you know they did for a variety of reasons. The, the simplest is that you're in a research laboratory, and so you know how are you going to control and 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 create a potentially positive experience for individuals in the setting of you know a, a research setting, um, and so this is this is the way that this study was done, and. Uh, and so this, here are some results from this, this study, which I said was kind of open Pandora's box. It was from individuals at Hopkins, uh, published in 2006. And, and a couple of the things that were notable and generated buzz and interest, I'm going to show you. One is, is they collected data about how personally meaningful was this experience. And they used uh, methylphenidate as the placebo. Of course, again, you know, it wasn't as if it was really effectively blinding individuals. Um, and the majority of individuals answered that psilocybin was among the, the psilocybin dose, as well as the you know associated preparation and integration, was among the most top five most meaningful experiences in their life. Um, a number said that it was the most significant experience in their life, uh, and and then and not so with the methylphenidate, which is shown in the striped bars. And so 61% um, reported a mystical experience according to the mystical experience questionnaire that they used. 67% uh, said it was the top five most meaningful lifetime experiences. And 90%, the other thing that they looked at was various measures of life satisfaction, mood, personality, including asking um, individuals close to the study participants. 90% uh, reported improved mood uh, and relationships as a consequence of the psilocybin dose. So, as you can imagine, there was a lot of skepticism, but also a lot of interest, and 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 so you know this really was the first published uh, academic research, basically in 30 years, at least um, since the DEA had had put psilocybin and psychedelics on the Schedule One list. And, and uh, since then, things have really exploded and bloomed. Uh, but, but just to challenge or contrast the idea that it is, this, it is the subjective experience that is fundamentally the reason why these drugs are therapeutic, um, here is a graph of uh, depression rating score on the y-axis. It's actually changed from post-psilocybin to pre-psilocybin. Um, and mystical experience score on the x-axis. And what you can see is that they are correlated, but it's a pretty puny correlation. So there's plenty of people who reported that they did not have a uh, strong mystical experience but reported substantial improvement of their depression. And there is uh, 
uh, plenty of people who reported that they did not have any therapeutic benefit to their depression, but they did have a strong mystical experience, or at least a few. And it's a relatively small sample. But, you know, I'm, I don't think you could look at this and say, well, obviously, it's the experience that's causing the antidepressant effect, because it mostly just looks like a cloud of dots, right? <laughs> um, and, and so, uh, so this has sparked in more recent years a, a debate with what I'm going to show you is the second um, kind of idea for why psychedelics are antidepressant. And, and this centers around the neurotrophic hypothesis. And, uh, and I'll give you a little background for what the neurotrophic hypothesis is. And, and so hopefully this argument will start to make sense to you. So basically, you could phrase it like this. Mood disorders are characterized by atrophy of neurons uh, in limbic circuits. And drugs that stimulate plasticity are antidepressant. And, and as we know in psychiatry, saying that something's antidepressant often means that it has, or likely means that it, it has therapeutic benefit even across a range of, you know, uh, potentially anxiety, potentially uh, addiction, range of comorbid and, and related uh, disorders. And, and so there's evidence of this idea, uh, not just in depression, is, is what I'm trying to say. And, and so to, to put the, the idea into visual terms, uh, if you look in, and of course this is in rodents, but if you look in the hippocampus or prefrontal cortex of a rat, um, you see that in healthy animals there is a certain level of uh, growth of axons and dendrites, uh, particularly in the hippocampus, which probably has the, you know, the most plasticity even going into adulthood. Um, and, this, and a certain level of proliferation of stem cells, so new growth of new neurons. And the, you know, a key observation is this, is that when you, when you put mammals into a high stress environment, which can be done in a variety of ways, um, you get a reduction in, in these markers of plasticity. So you get a reduction in growth of new connections, you get a reduction in growth of neural stem cells, and antidepressants uh, correct or recover that deficit, recover that atrophy, um, and restore plasticity. And, and this has been shown essentially across many classes of antidepressants, and so that's why it's really become this broad uh, idea about how we should think about depression and treatment of mood disorders. Um, and in particular, ketamine and psychedelics um, the, the term psychoplastogens has been coined um, recently, and, and essentially what's implied by it is that these are compounds that rapidly rewire, uh, rewire neural circuitry by engaging plasticity mechanisms. Whereas uh, some of the, so some of the uh, classic antidepressants or conventional antidepressants take weeks to have, start to see this neurotrophic effect. And so just to give a little evidence of this, um, you can even measure this in a dish, with neurons in a dish, uh, and you can, under the right settings, circumstances of course, you expose them to ketamine and you see a growth of, of neurites, which is axons and dendrites, and you can measure that so they, you know, they'll apply this little concentric circle thing and it's just a way of quantifying the growth of axons and dendrites. And it turns out that the same is true with psychedelics. You put a little squirt of psychedelics in the dish and you see a growth of axons and dendrites and you can count that and you can show that what this is showing is that if you block, if you pre-treat with something that blocks the 5-HT2A receptor, which you remember I said is a key uh, receptor for the psychedelic kind of effect, you block that effect. You block the neurotrophic effect. And, and this has also been measured in vivo, in living animals. Um, but important to note, really has not yet been measured in humans, um, which is a, a whole interesting area that part of my research has worked on. And I don't really go into detail here because we haven't published on it yet. But uh, 
uh, happy to discuss more. Um, but in mice, what you see is that synaptogenesis is necessary and sufficient for the lasting antidepressant effects of ketamine and psilocybin. So you block, so there's these cool optogenetic studies, you block the formation of new synapses and you lose the antidepressant phenotype of ketamine in, in rodents, um, suggesting that it is very therapeutically important to the therapeutic mechanism. And, and just to briefly touch here on what has become a very uh, high interest area of research, uh, it turns out there's been, there's been a few high profile studies in the last few years showing that, in fact, you can take uh, psychedelics and slightly modify their structure uh, so that they produce the neurotrophic effect without producing, at least it looks like in, in animal models, uh, without producing the hallucinogenic effect. So these are being termed non-hallucinogenic psychedelic analogs. And, and uh, I know at least a number of uh, pharmaceutical companies are betting on trying to develop these drugs, um, which, as you can imagine, might have applications in settings or in individuals who a psychedelic would not be an ideal treatment choice. Uh, and, then, and then I guess I'll just point out, since uh, I was asked about it, we talked about it a little bit beforehand, is that uh, there might be actually some similarity in terms of the mechanism of why and how these drugs are working with, with the idea of microdosing psychedelics. Um, but it's an ongoing science. And so what I've showed you so far is that, you know, there's those who argue that it's this transformational experience with psychedelics, um, and then there's those who have argued that it's the neurogenesis that is why, you know, these seem to have antidepressant effects. Um, but, but and, and these two ends of the spectrum have kind of clashed, and, and really it's created a kind of interesting debate, actually. Um, but, uh, but, but I think an important question is, you know, how do these two things connect? Do they connect? What is, how do they relate to each other? What's going on in the middle level in terms of how brain systems and cognitive systems are relating, you know, connecting to the neurotrophic effects at the molecular level and to the, you know, subjective experience at the, at the kind of systems or cognitive level. And that's really the focus of my research. So I will take a a little time to talk to you about the research that I've been involved in at Washington University. And so um, we have just uh, finished this study recently, which was psilocybin precision brain, brain mapping, where we took a group of individuals. It's important to say this, this study was healthy adults without any major psychiatric illness. and. Essentially what we did is, which I'm trying to show here at the top, is uh, put them in the scanner over and over again to get a longitudinal baseline. And when I say scanner, I mean MRI. So we looked at resting state, functional connectivity. We looked at a few different other measures. We had them perform tasks. And we gave them a high dose of psilocybin. We put them on this, in the scanner on the dose. And then we also imaged them for a few weeks afterwards um, so that we could really take this approach in which we are individually mapping the brain connectome and uh, looking at brain networks and, and use it to get a much more sensitive and higher resolution answer to how psychedelics might be changing the brain both acutely and in the weeks after a high dose. And we also used methylphenidate as a control, uh, mostly because it, it, we can match some of the arousal effects uh, just the sympathetic arousal effects of, of a psychedelic. And so these are some of the individuals who worked on this study with me. Uh, and and, I'll ju and, and uh, you know, we measured a variety of behavioral things and imaging markers. And, and I'll just give you a few of what I think are the interesting and relevant results from this study. Um, one is that acutely, the high dose of psilocybin is dramatically changing pattern of brain connectivity. And so this is just a, uh, a picture of, a, of the brain with a scale of disruption of connectivity relative to kind of normal day-to-day -day variability. And, and on the left, you see psilocybin. On the right, you see methylphenidate. Um, you can 
you know, we looked at a few different other variables. So, you know, things like sleep versus wake, um, some other medications, SSRIs, not in this study, but we compared to data, you know, with other medications. And, and the, the point is that the, the degree to which psilocybin is altering normal patterns of brain connectivity is, you know, an order of magnitude above these other drugs that are not, you know, uh, changing your subjective experience of reality. And so maybe that makes intuitive sense. Uh, and, and this is just showing what I just said kind of in, in bar graph form for the, the uh, whole brain network change. Uh, and one thing that's kind of interesting here is we actually, you can look at like difference between, between individuals, which you know, we, we thought was far larger than any intervention that we could give. It was just the difference between my brain and your brain. Um, and, but you know, the amount that psilocybin changed normal brain connectivity was effectively as large as the difference between individuals. So you can just see, I don't have a cursor here, but you can see the you know, median uh, network change for psilocybin there um, and the median network change for between person uh, are pretty close. And, and if you look at this map, uh, what turns out is that the, it's particular areas of the brain that are affected. It's, you could broadly say, association cortex. And you can specifically measure by uh, resting state network or brain network. And you can see that there is enriched, uh, the change is, is localizing to what we call the default mode network. Um, so I'm curious, maybe you could, can show me by show of hands, who has heard of the default mode network? Okay, a couple, okay, all right. So, so um, the, the, to briefly summarize, the default mode network is a brain system that uh, is involved in internal conception of self. So maybe it, start, it helps to start by pointing out that when you engage in a task uh, that's difficult, the default mode network actually deactivates. Uh, and the more difficult the task is and the more engaged you are with it, the more the default mode network deactivates. And then when you're not engaged in a task and you're just letting your mind wander, your default mode network is more active. And so some of the things that have been attributed to it are, are kind of self-reference, um, your definition of yourself, your thinking about yourself in past situations and in, and in future situations. Um, and, and you know, notably uh, in individuals with depression who are reporting rumination, uh, it's overactive. Um, so there has been kind of interesting relevance to disease. And so what we see is that specifically psilocybin is, uh, is totally disrupting and actually desynchronizing activity in the default mode network. Um, and, and it's also notable that uh, it has, the default mode network has strong connections with the hippocampus, which, uh, you know, has roles in memory, has roles in a number of things, but um, spatial orientation, um, and, and in particular the anterior hippocampus. So I'm showing the hippocampus there uh, at the bottom of the brain there, the red and blue thing, that's a hippocampus. And, uh, and the red part is the anterior hippocampus, the blue part is the posterior hippocampus. And the reason it's colored red is because uh, it is highly connected with the default mode network, which I'm just showing a little snippet of the default mode network in the, in the uh, posterior cingulate cortex there. Um, and the role of those connections uh, is, is believed to be self-oriented uh, memory function, basically. Um, so you're, you know, some of the things I talked about with remembering your role and your place in past events, um, and in, I think in present events as well, uh, and, and so here if we just look using the same color scale that I showed in the last slide for brain network disruption, um, just look, zoom into the hippocampus, um, the top little oval is the left hippocampus um, disruption acutely during psilocybin, and the 
bottom oval is the disruption on average for two weeks after, or when I say disruption, maybe that's not a great word, but the change from pre-dose levels in the two weeks after psilocybin. And so what we saw in this study um, is that there was this area that um, in the anterior hippocampus there, just a little kind of uh, yellow and orange blip on the top and green blip on the bottom that is altered uh, and remains at least changed to some degree after psilocybin. And, and here's kind of a, a time course of connectivity between the anterior hippocampus, this is the whole anterior campus, not just a little blip that I'm showing. If you just take kind of um, without using priors, the anterior hippocampus and look at the connectivity with the default mode network, um, what you see is that I'm showing individual subjects um, in different colors here, so sorry it's kind of a lot to look at, um, but I've lined them all up so that their psilocybin dose was at day zero, and uh, pre-dose is negative on the x-axis and post-dose is positive, and, and so you have kind of baseline connectivity between the anterior hippocampus and the the cortex, specifically default mode network, and then after the dose of psilocybin, there appears to be a decrease uh, in those connections. And uh, by we had individuals come back a year later, or six months to a year later, and do an additional psilocybin dose. And so by the time they come back, so this first, uh, there's no way to point, but the first black dot on the right is the six month after baseline, and so connectivity has returned at, at six months later between the default mode network and the hippocampus. And again, with the second dose, it decreases again. So hopefully that, that makes some sense. And, and so, you know, I, I will just say that this is, this is a theory, and, and I don't have good evidence. I mean, it's not a theory. There is, there is a statistical effect, but I don't have good evidence for what exactly you know, how you should interpret the fact that psilocybin is decreasing the connection between the hippocampus and the default mode network. But it is something that we observed and, and you know, it's, it's of particular interest because as of now, there's really no human neurobiological data about how a psychedelic might have persisting effects on the, on the human brain and what those might be. So just to rephrase that and summarize that, uh, you can give a third answer here, which is that uh, at the network level, default mode network desynchronization and reset of hippocampal cortical circuits may play a role in how psychedelics are producing a persistent therapeutic effect. And, and uh, I want to finish just by uh, pointing out some risks and concerns and kind of weighing the balance uh, and, you know, looking forward at where things are going with, you know, the field of psychedelic research and psychedelic therapy. So a couple of the major concerns, as at least from my standpoint, are that I've mentioned. One is the lack of adequately blinded and controlled clinical trials, uh, which is not to necessarily fault the researchers, but just to say that it's a very difficult challenge in doing clinical research with psychedelics, um, which relevant, relatedly, the high risk for placebo effect due to suggestibility and selection bias. And so the reason I add, put this slide in addition to the, the prior one is to remind myself to just kind of break down what I'm talking about with why is it concerned that individuals might not be blinded. Um, so here's how I think about it. If you are signing up for a clinical trial with a psychedelic, and I can tell you this from my personal experience screening participants for our studies, uh, there's a good likelihood that you have, you know, heard some of the growing and unescapable buzz about psychedelics, or you have some prior reason based on your experience or others around you to think that this might cause, you know, a transformational experience or a therapeutic experience for you. And when you combine that prior uh, expectancy effect with uh, a study in which you know you're going to know by the end whether you got, uh, or at least you're going to probably be able to guess whether you got the active drug or the placebo, uh, 
um, you're in a situation where you have a serious risk for um, you know, a confound that's kind of inflating effect size of psychedelics clinical trials. So you know, I, I think it's really worth thinking about that. Um, and, uh, and then you know, another point which I haven't really touched on is, is just that uh, we're likely looking at a scenario where uh, psychedelics will be approved and by the FDA within the next few years for depression, if not some other indication. Uh, and uh, even if that's not the case, we're looking at already a scenario where they're increasingly decriminalized and available and, uh, and or being made available for medical use. Uh, but there's not really a clear path to clinical implementation. Um, it's a, you know, the studies that have been done have a demanding protocol that's not necessarily scalable, having two therapists sitting for eight hours you can imagine is not very practical in addition to preparation and integration therapy. Uh, and then, you know, also just a bigger challenge, which is even outside of the medical context, um, you know, as these drugs become increasingly available and accepted, uh, how do we fit them into our society? Um, so I think those are some of the challenges that are going to be really important to address. And then, and then, you know, I'm ending with a SWOT diagram, which I think is just kind of a, a nice way to put together and summarize um, a lot of the things that I've touched on. Um, so, you know, just to quickly go through it, how am I doing on time? Um, the, some strengths are that things have looked very positive in, in many of the trials that have been done over the last uh, decade um, with a, even a single dose of psilocybin, which would be a huge benefit or positive compared to having to take a pill daily or multiple times a day for indefinitely. Um, in terms of safety, in terms of having a, you know, a lethal overdose or a, a um, serious adverse event, um, psychedelics look pretty safe under the right circumstances. Um, and they're able to evoke behavioral change, which I think is you know, of huge potential value. Uh, some weaknesses, as I mentioned, administering the therapy is time consuming for the participant and for the provider. Um, it requires specialized training to facilitate. Um, blinding has been a major challenge and certainly you know, they will not be of interest or uh, available or safe for everyone. Uh, I think there are still unexplored, you know, depression has been the first kind of, we'll say, frontier. Um, but there are potential other avenues, including interest with eating disorders. Um, and then, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see where these non-hallucinogenic analogs go. Uh, and some threats and questions are, are as of now, this is, these are still DEA Schedule One drugs. Um, and so, you know, it's unclear what, what's going to happen with that. Um, they're difficult to patent, which is both a pro and a con uh, from the threat standpoint, it makes it harder for a company to go through all the work that it takes to make sure that they're creating a safe uh, and, you know, well-manufactured and accessible treatment um, because they don't have the financial incentive to do that. Um, and, uh, and we, you know, an important question is still kind of understanding what makes psychedelics effective and when. Do you need the subjective experience? You know, how often would individuals need to be redosed, for example, um, if they had a psychedelic treatment with a positive um, response? And, and, you know, a big question that I am particularly involved with is what does plasticity in a rodent brain, what does that mean? You know, how obviously does that, how does that relate to humans, to the human brain, to the human experience? And I'll close with that. And... A thanks to the many individuals, uh, many at WashU, who, who have worked with me and helped me with this research, and for all of the support um, that I've received, um, and that we as a group, in particular, I'll point out Ginger Nichol. She, she was uh, as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and, and probably a big part of the reason I was invited to this. She's, she's an eating disorder specialist. Um, 
and she's been the PI on, she was the PI on the first psilocybin studies, so, uh, which were done while I was in residency, and so, uh, you know, she has been crucial with, with starting this research um, program. So I'll close with that and open it up to questions. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you so much. That was really, really um, an amazing presentation. And I have a series of questions from people who've been viewing remotely. I also, we have some time for people in the room who also have questions. But we can start with one of the remote folks. On the lethality chart, I believe this is the per this person is talking about the addictive potential chart. Mm -hmm. uh, what is where does ayahuasca land in terms of research or risks? That is a great question that I don't know the answer to. I yeah, I'm I really I'm not sure. I think there is likely some pharmacologist out there would have done the research, but I don't know. So I have to okay. punt on that one. Okay, good question. Yeah, um, I'm gonna look it up after this. Anyone in the room have a question or questions? Was, was state becoming legal? Sorry. That's okay. Um, was state becoming legal? I know Colorado is supposed to be legal in, the, in next year, I think. How does that open things up for treatments? So the question is, with states becoming legal or legalizing psychedelics, how does that open things up for treatments? Yeah, and, and that's a great question. And and this is something that I've I have been involved in. We, I did a fun side project with um, some folks at the Wash U Law School, kind of reviewing the uh, the uh, legislation, both proposed and passed um, from different states um, for psychedelic decriminalization. And and I'll tell you one of the one of the major things that stood out from doing that. Uh, was the fact that every state is basically doing their own thing and has set completely different standards um, for what is what does decriminalization meet, mean? Some states have just, you know, uh, either put forward or passed legislation to deprioritize uh, prosecution of, of psychedelic related offenses. Some states have, you know, uh, uh, created this right to try system, which really I think was following in the steps of what has been done in, in with decriminalization of uh, cannabis. Um, and, and so there's been this, and then, you know, Oregon is like one end of the spectrum where they built this very detailed, comprehensive uh, piece of legislation and associated, you know, uh, plans to create actual um, treatment, you know, systems including growth uh, or uh, I think growth of psychedelic of psilocybin mushrooms, you know, standards for testing purity, standards for certifying therapists, um, and then other states have really are at the other end of the spectrum. And my understanding of the of the Colorado legislation is that it is much more minimal and is has said that these drugs will be decriminalized, meaning that uh, they, you know, police cannot prosecute somebody for possession of psychedelics. Um, but I think that in and of itself is not likely to uh, do a lot to build, um, directly at least, build medical treatment with psychedelics, um, you know, because there's a whole other host of risks, challenges, concerns, uh, questions. Uh, what, it, what it may do is enable research that wasn't being done otherwise, um, which is kind of considered a, a step towards making these clinically available. So make it easier, for example, less barriers to doing clinical trials like some of the ones that I'm involved in uh, in Colorado. Um, but, but really I think, you know, there is there is this whole other side. There's decriminalization, and then there's medical treatment. And um, you know, at this point, we're like, what word do I want to use? A hodgepodge of where states have 
the road that states have gone down, and, and it's an open question as to how will that progress? How will the federal government at some point change regulations about psychedelics that you know, I think we're waiting apprehensively to, to see the answer to? that you're using in these trials, the 25 milligram, um, and, and I'm asking because in working with the adolescents, I'm seeing an, an unfortunate increase in, in the, the amount of cases of HPPD, um, the hallucinogen persistent perception or disorder. Are you seeing any, like, any, any of this? I mean, you're, you're following some of these patients long term during six months after, like, are, have you seen any increase in, like, pre prevalence incidence of so the question is, um, and this is from one of our child and adolescent psychiatrists, who's seeing more cases of hallucinogen um, persisting perceptual disorder, um, which is very apropos. The Monitoring the Future uh, report just came out showing that increases in hallucinogens are on the rise in adolescents, but also the biggest at historic levels for 35 to 50 year olds, right? Are you in your research subjects seeing any HPPD at your longer term follow-up? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And the answer pretty categorically is no. Um, and, and this is true not just in my participants, but really across clinical trials that have been done, I kind of broke down how they've been done and the screening criteria, which includes excluding individuals with you know self or first degree relatives with um, psychotic disorder history um, and this and, and so I think that is part of it and let me finish what I was saying there has been no uh, reports in follow-up which to, for the for the most part there has been pretty careful you know follow-up and screening for because of concern of HPPD um, and there's been no no incidence of it and and so then the second question is is why would that be the case and why would it be that you're seeing it uh, in, in some individuals, but it's not being seen in clinical trials. And I think there's two, to me, reasons. One, one I just stated, which is excluding risk, individuals would be higher risk. But the other, which, and, and I guess I could say this is mostly anecdotal, um, or at least I could say that I have anecdotal evidence for it. Um, is that taking these drugs with the preparation, the monitoring, and the integration um, alleviates uh, or reduces the risk for uh, hallucinogen post-perceptual disorder substantially. Um, I could, you know, go on a diatribe about why that is, um, but I, I'll, I'll say just very briefly that um, I, th I think that the, you know, being in a controlled setting, you know, having what all the other screening that goes along with being in, a, in research and having integration with a, you know, mental health professional, uh, really there's a, there's a key, you might say, drug by environment interaction with these drugs. And you know, the, the set and setting of psychedelics use is, has importance at, at every level, really, uh, in terms of the consequence of use. We have another question in the room. You know what, my question is the same one. Same so question. Get these, these young brains, a lot of these kids are starting earlier. And your study started at 1845 in the deficit group. Is there a difference when you break out, because we're still looking at the brain still developing till 25, is there a difference between those two? Yeah, yeah. So the question is, is there a difference based on the level of current brain development? We talked a little bit about this before the, before the talk, right? Like, right. Can we look at that group from 18 to 25 whose brains are still developing? Are there differences in effect? Uh, directly on the brain or on behavioral phenotypes post psychedelic treatment for that subgroup whose brains are still developing and people who are 25 and older. Yeah, yeah. We, so we had a good conversation about this right before this, and and 
and I think it's a great question, and uh, it's maybe I should have listed it on my open questions because really there is, so I don't believe there's been anything published in individuals under the age of 18 being given psychedelics in a controlled experimental setting. And really there's been minimal, I think, analysis even in 18 and up, you know, if there is, I think it's very possible that and likely that you would see differences in how it affects a 19-year-old brain versus a 50-year-old brain, um, but we don't know the answer yet. So it's one of the things that will be important to find out. Here's another one from afar. Have you seen the photos of Timothy Leary's brain after he died? <laughs> uh, okay. No. No. Um, but I will say, tangentially related to that, that, and this is a real tangent, uh, there, there was this famous picture I think it was on the cover of Science Magazine. Oh, I say famous. Like, if you're in nerdy psychedelics research circles like I'm in, famous, um, of a, uh, a monkey with some primate's brain after they had been given uh, ecstasy or MDMA. And it's got, like, these little holes in it. <laughs> and it's like, you know, this is your brain on drugs sort of thing. And, uh, and, and then if you look at the study, which I think was ultimately retracted, um, but what they had done was give these primates very high doses of MDMA repeatedly for many days <laughs> or weeks even. Um, and, and so the, the point that I'm making is, is whatever Timothy Leary's brain looked like, it might not be a, a good, it might actually be a uh, distraction or a detraction from the more... Uh, controlled sort of use of psychedelics that I'm talking about here. <laughs> yes. So maybe he looked like the monkeys. I don't know. I'll have to go look it up afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, sort of along those lines, you know, one of the things that I, I didn't see you mention on the SWOT analysis, for example, how much money is in the psychedelic um, development space, one, um, and two, of the studies that have been done to date, what percentage of those are privately funded versus publicly funded? And is this the same as other psychopharmacology trials? Yeah, Does that help yeah, yeah. Or hinder, you know, the development of these? Yeah, so it is, it is not the same. Um, yeah, so it, no, it's a good question and point. And so a lot of the research that has been done academically has been uh, funded by private donations. And I guess there's like two complementary reasons for that. One is because there's, you know, aging kind of baby boomers who, some of which are very passionate about psychedelics. Um, and then the, the complement to that is that up until quite recently, the NIH has been pretty reluctant to fund psychedelics research. Now that has started to change um, as they have gotten, you know, from, from the reports of Josh Gordon, who's the head of the NIMH barrages of applications of, of folks interested in researching psychedelics. Um, but uh, yeah, but m much of the research has been privately funded. Um, and, and there is also, in complement, has been quite a lot of investment in the private sector. And this was like, you know, this was, it was kind of wild for me to watch over the last few years. There was a bunch of, a number of psychedelics startups um, that, you know, would kind of, op that would uh, IPO as publicly traded companies offering whatever idea for psychedelics and, and kind of be inflated to be worth like, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, and <laughs> it, it, it didn't and still doesn't to some degree make sense to me um, why that was. I think there, part of it is just that there's been a lot of interest. Um, a lot of that has maybe come down to earth now um, for 
variety of reasons, one of which I mentioned, which is that uh, you can grow a psilocybin mushroom, so you're not exactly creating novel IP by patenting, trying to patent psilocybin. Um, and I also just think, uh, you know, this is my investment advice to all of you out there, uh, we have no idea what the future is going to be, as I mentioned, you know, legally, um, medically, socially, and so it's just, it's, you know, it, it, uh, I think it's impossible to bet on where things are going to go for companies that are trying to, trying to build a, you know, business model around psychedelics. Um, was there another part of the question that I'm missing? Does that help <laughs> or hinder? Does all oh, right. the, you know, money in the space right now help or hinder or both? I, I think it's, it's, it has probably helped accelerate research and, and interesting science that's emerged. Um, you know, I don't know if it's, it's biased things. That's certainly possible in, in one particular way. And I don't know if it's, uh, it has reduced maybe the standards for research that NIH-funded research would have. And so part of the, you know, I think that might be a part of the reason that, that I mentioned this kind of lack of well-controlled studies. Part of the reason is just the fundamental fact that it's difficult to design well-controlled, well-blinded, uh, studies with psychedelics, but I think probably both of those have played a part as to why there's been so really few. Yep. Do you see a, a hinge between the development of psychedelics and the acceleration of stigma and misinformation when the entrepreneurial people like Tracy T are out there, you know, talking about, you know, at a, a truly lay person's level, mom to mom, do you have opinions about that? Is it, yeah, I'll stop there. So the question I believe is, do you have opinions about whether it hinders the progress if you have private industry talking directly to consumers, directly to moms, you know, directly to dads, directly to patient, potential customers. Um, does that make things worse as far as when you're looking at scientific progress and medical progress, right? Different, as you said, from legalization, like legislature, lawmaking versus medicine. So any opinions on, does that help, does that hurt? Yeah. Well, um, I just started watching this documentary on Netflix called Painkillers. <laughs> uh, it's about Purdue Pharma selling OxyContin. So that's the thing that first comes to mind when, when you ask that question. So uh, certainly from you know, it, my, the medical perspective, it's a challenge uh, and potentially a danger um, when you have all of these other voices you know, entering in and kind of making it harder to have a sober, objective conversation about, you know, how should these drugs be regulated, approved, used, etc. No question about that, you know. Uh, but, but, I mean, I think to be fair, medical is just one side of, of the kind of what people are calling the psychedelics renaissance. So, uh, certainly other people outside of medical perspective, uh, medical Establishment have other perspectives on whether or not it, it hurts or helps. There's one other question from uh, the remote, uh, remote viewer. You mentioned Walter Kay from University of California, San Diego, has, uh, his group studying psychedelics in anorexia nervosa. Um, do you know what the results or the preliminary results of those studies have looked like? Well, all I know and you might, you might know more than I do, I don't know, but, but uh, I, the answer is, is really no I, in terms of effectiveness. Uh, they recently published a, a paper in Nature Medicine um, which was really just demonstrating safety and feasibility of psilocybin for anorexia nervosa. It was, I think, 10 female uh, anorexia nervosa patients, but really not, you know, not uh, sized to make any assertions about effectiveness. Right. No, I, I would concur with that. I think it's interesting to think about from a, how, how does the molecular level connect with the systems level and the behavior mind level. One of the things we know about anorexia nervosa 
and, and the patients that were in this study had long-standing anorexia nervosa, is the interoception uh, is intense and unshakable. Um, surrounding body image and surrounding eating or not eating. And that, you know, when, when looking at some of the research you presented on default uh, node uh, networks and how the psychedelics sort of dial people back out a bit, um, it theoretically would make sense that any of the psychiatric disorders that have um, that, that habit loop deeply, deeply cemented in um, you know, might theoretically benefit from that, but it's it's very, very, very s small n and very preliminary at this at this point. Adele LaFrance is another researcher who's looked at psychedelics in eating disorders, specifically um, studying MDMA, and has I believe has done a phase two trial um, that looks promising. Yes. Yeah, I was going to ask, most of the studies that, um, or it seems like most of the studies you've presented are based on high doses of the psilocybin. Are there studies done on like microdosing? Yes. So the question is, have there been any studies done on microdosing? Yeah, yeah. And so microdosing is certainly an area of, of interest. Um, and there have been some, but really uh, I... To my knowledge, there have not been well, you know, placebo-controlled microdosing studies. I think there are some ongoing now, um, but uh, you know, we haven't seen the results yet. And and what's been published is not particularly well controlled, uh, and has had some conflicting results. Some studies claiming positive effects in you know cognitive measures or in depression, and others kind of refuting that there were effects. So I think uh, wait and see. So to respect the time boundary for those here and outside of here, I just want to thank you again for such an amazing presentation. I want to thank Diane Karagudi and Sal Swanson here for all the work that went into putting this on today. Um, and if any of you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, I know that the information about the CEUs uh, will be available to any of you along with your registration. So thank you again very much for coming here and for an amazing presentation. <laughs>